Hey guys, welcome back to Nick's Reads. In this reading vlog, I'm going to read the four worst rated books that I own according to Goodreads. I already know that this is going to be an odd one. If this is the first ever video you're watching, please know that this is usually a very positive space. We love books around here. We love finding five star reads and we root to love books. And we certainly don't enjoy trashing books, even if a rave here and there sometimes feels very satisfying. This year, I have a goal to read as much as I can from the books that I already own. Truthfully, the main purpose of this video is to find a fun way to build a TBR for the month. So let's go to my Goodreads profile to see what are these four worst rated books that I own. Let's go to a tag that I call waiting on my bookshelves. This is where I put all of the books that I buy. So the worst one is The Next to Die by Sophie Hanna with 2.98 stars. Oh my goodness, I can't remember the last time I had a book that was rated under three stars. Then we have Beatrice and Virgil by Jan Martel with 3.18 stars, which is surprising because he wrote The Life of Pi, which is a worldwide bestseller and beloved by many. Then we have The Swan Book by Alexis Wright. This is a dystopian novel doesn't have a lot of ratings and then we have chick or the english title is why we took the car by wolfgang handoff has a rating of 3.56 stars so this is not too bad it is a little disheartening that three of the four books in here i bought during the same library book sale where you buy books by the kilo i just picked these books up because i thought they sounded good so my hope for this video is that I'm going to end up giving these books a higher rating than the average on Goodreads. I'm going to try to figure out why it is that people dislike these books. I do reserve the right to DNF a book, which stands for did not finish. So to just put the book away after I feel like I've given it a proper chance, just because it's one of the things I'm trying to be better at. All right. So this is our four books for the month and we'll start with this one. Happy Saturday. I'm about 100 pages into The Next to Die. That's about a quarter of the book. Now let's talk about it. So one of the reasons I picked this up in the first place is because of the author herself. Now, around four years ago, I bought this book. It's an Agatha Christie story. It's called Close Casket. I didn't realize at the time that it wasn't by Agatha Christie. It was written by Sophie Hanna and she was allowed to write this with Agatha Christie characters. So it was my first Hercule Poirot novel. I have to thank Sophie Hanna for introducing me to Hercule Poirot and thanks to her, Agatha Christie is now one of my favorite authors. So the premise of this is that there's a serial killer who targets pairs of best friends. So he kills two people who are best friends with each other and I thought that just sounded quite interesting. It's marketed as a psychological suspense. Now on Goodreads, it has just over 4,000 ratings. It's rated at 2.98. That is very, very low. So only on Goodreads, I saw that this is number 10 in the Spilling Criminal Investigation Department book series. But judging from the summary, I think you can read it as a standalone. This one star review describes this book as outlandish. She's incredulous that anyone can't get along with this utterly ludicrous plot and totally neurotic set of characters with ridiculous idiosyncrasies. I'll get to that, but I, I must say I kind of agree with this statement. And then the five star review is obviously glowing and she says that she adores these really great writing, really great storytelling, totally addictive plots. A lot of them are either DNFs or one star. So let's see if I'll go with the masses and either DNF this or give this an under three star review. Now for the first 50 pages, I was thinking to myself, this is not as bad as people make it to be. I, it was fine. It wasn't, it was clearly not going to be a five star read, but was, I was also not hating my experience. Then around the 80 page mark, I hit a plateau where I thought, okay, this is just really not for me. Right from the beginning, I do have to say most of the characters are very eccentric, not just because that is their personality, but their characters seem to be overly exaggerated, written over the top. There's quite a few scenes in here where you're basically in a meeting with a bunch of different investigators. They're always bickering with each other, so there seems to be a substantial part in here that is 
in interpersonal drama between colleagues, which I don't particularly enjoy. There's some really odd passages of dialogues in here. What I also didn't expect is that this is kind of a mixed text approach. So some parts are written just following the investigation. Then there's parts in here that are piece, a piece of a memoir that was written after the fact, I think, by a comedian. I don't know yet what her role in this whole thing is. I have a suspicion. And then right in the beginning, there's this strange fixation on this feminist blogger. And this blogger keeps being framed by these investigators as a feminist man-hating uh, vigilante. So far this is tonally, thematically, and character-wise all over the place. I don't know where this is going. I'm not ready to DNF this yet. I'm hoping that I can finish this book, but I also will not make any promises. Because I just finished this book, we decided to watch the Kira Knightley adaptation of Anna Karenina tonight. I'm calling it. I'm sorry. This is going to be a DNF. I made it to page 118. To be exact, I made it to a three-page stretch of 18 very specific rules that this comedian has set up for people who want to meet her. I'm really not enjoying myself. I'm not excited anymore about what the resolution of this cases. And before that, there was once again just so much overwritten dialogue and bickering and fighting between these investigators, which was so out of place. So while I was debating if I should keep going and just finish this for the sake of the vlog, my eyes may or may not have been wandering to the last portions of the book and I might or might not have found the exact passage that tells you who the killer is and what their motive is and let me tell you their reasoning is absolutely ridiculous it is so absurd that i want to tell you obviously if you don't want to be spoiled what i'll do is i'll put an emoji here when you see it disappear you can unmute me again so the killer decided to go and murder a bunch of people because they don't like e-readers and the victims had e-readers. It's fine, I'm not upset. I hope you're not upset. I'm gonna donate this book. This still serves my purpose of reading down my physical TBR, right? I gave this a fair shot. I read more of this than I wanted to, decided it's not for me, and now it's off my pile of books and out of my mind. We're gonna move on to the next one. You know, I have my issues with Goodreads, with the Goodreads Choice Awards, but sometimes Goodreads is also right. Good evening guys. Today was an office day and I cannot tell you how happy I am that I came home and it's still light outside and not pitch black. The next to die was obviously a miss for me. I'm so sorry if this is one of your favorite authors or your favorite thriller. I started the next book on my list which was Beatrice and Virgil by Jan Martel and this is the opposite of that it seems like because I am only about 40 pages in and you can see that I already started tabbing this book. This author wrote the infamous Life of Pi. I have not read that book. I did watch the movie a few years ago, so I know roughly what it's about. In short, this book is about a writer named Henry, and he receives a letter by a reader who happens to be a taxidermist and is a struggling writer himself. So he goes and visits this man and meets Beatrice and Virgil. One of the first things that it mentions is that Henry the writer previously brought out a book that got super famous and it, it was even turned into a movie and that really put him on the map. Is this writer, Jan Martel, writing about himself? Is he Henry? Is Henry him? And the more I kept reading, the more curious I became. So I actually then started reading his bio on Wikipedia and yes, it looks like there's par so many parallels, if not all of them. I mean, I'm only 40 pages in between Henry's life and the author's life. So now I'm wondering, is this some type of way for him to process the fame that he got with Life of Pi? So now reading this, I cannot help but picture Henry as literally the author, and maybe that is in part what he's intending to do, because without giving too much away, one of the big projects that Henry is working on is a book between fiction and nonfiction. And this is actually the first sentence that I had to highlight, because it just really had an impact on me. It left a big impression. If history doesn't become story, it dies to everyone except the historian. 
art is the suitcase of history carrying the essentials. I thought that was so beautiful and really made me think. And in this passage, Henry is explaining why he feels the need of using animals instead of humans in his story. If I tell a story about a dentist from Bavaria or Saskatchewan, I have to deal with the reader's notions about dentists and people from Bavaria or Saskatchewan, those preconceptions and stereotypes that lock people and stories into small boxes. But if it's a rhinoceros from Bavaria or Saskatchewan who is the dentist, then it's an entirely different matter. The reader pays closer attention because he or she has no preconceptions about rhinoceros dentists from Bavaria or anywhere else. The reader's disbelief begins to lift like a stage curtain. Now the story can unfold more easily. There's nothing like the unimaginable to make people believe. So you can tell that I'm having a good time with this. Let's quickly take a look at Goodreads. So this has an average rating of 3.18 out of over 21,000 ratings. I find that quite low. I am shaken with rage as the book is one of the most hateful and ghastly jumble of wars I have ever finished. Okay. And then this five-star review mentions the symbolism in the book is too loud and too abundant to make any real sense of it. And yet it is a five-star rating. So let's see where I fall into. I think I'm around the four-ish star mark at the moment. There's obviously some self-fulfilling prophecy in all of this, right? I wouldn't have even looked up the ratings, but then how do I pick the book? So <laughs> let's not take this prompt too seriously and let's be aware that I'm obviously biased. Hey friends, it's been quite a while since I last checked in with you. I'm still reading Beatrice and Virgil. I just had to slow down a bit on the weekend because I went to New York City. I had so much fun. I was there with a group of friends. I've been to New York City before about 10 years ago. I'm getting old. It blows my mind that I can say this now that I did things 10 years ago <laughs> for maybe a day and a half. So this time around, I did quite a bit of New York quintessential things. So like Central Park, um, Broadway show, I watched The Lion King, which moved me to tears on multiple occasions. It was so, so good. We watched Stand Up at the Comedy Cellar and I finally tried the famous Le Bain cookies as well as the soft serve with cereal milk flavor from Milk Bar, which honestly, both met my expectations as well as Shake Shack. I've never had Shake Shack before. I do have one book to show you that I bought at the Strand bookstore. Of course I had to go. So I got The Murder of Roger Ackroyd by Agatha Christie with an introduction by Ruth Ware. Moving on to an update on this book. You know from the last clip that I filmed that I was so, so excited about this one. The excitement went away. <laughs> We've moved on to a point in the story where our main character, Henry the writer, met Henry the taxidermist. They're spending a lot of time together in the taxidermy shop. We're reading pieces of the play that this taxidermist is writing about Beatrice and Virgil, so the donkey and the howler monkey. It suddenly went from being something very exciting when I thought this is a brilliant piece of literary fiction to just, I don't know what I'm reading at this point. I think the author is going for subtext, but it's really not working out. All I'm seeing in these dialogues is two people having a super awkward conversation with each other where they barely say anything and are just sitting around in a dark shop. Then these bits are broken up by the play, so the dialogue between Beatrice and Virgil. At this point, it is now clear that this play is some kind of metaphor for processing the Holocaust. I remember seeing some reviews that were saying that this is a very bad take on a very important and horrendous topic because they didn't like the subtext and the metaphor used in this and now I can start to see why. I'm so disappointed because this started out so strongly for me. I thought this is gonna be a four stars and now I'm somewhere around a two. I don't feel motivated to pick this book up but I'm gonna try to power through the rest of the book today. I highly underestimated how many times this reading project this month is gonna put me in reading slumps. I mean, the prompt is to read the worst rated books on my TBR, but I guess for some reason I was so arrogant to think that my opinion is going to differ from the masses and I'm going to end up loving these books and it's going to be so much fun, but so far, not so good. <laughs> I finished Beatrice and Virgil. I will say that it starts and ends on a high note. The beginning was incredibly strong, as I told you, and especially the end left me speechless. When I was reading through the end part section of this book, 
I felt my chest constrict. It was just incredibly impactful and it made me feel all, all sorts of things, mainly incredibly sad. Also, Jan Martel is clearly a very, very good writer. I think that the author, when conceptualizing this book, took a very big risk, but he was almost too clever for his own good because it didn't end up paying off the same way that I think he envisioned it. At least I didn't perceive it this way. There's enough people out there that gave this a brilliant five-star rating. I'd say that mainly this book is a conversation between two people or two animals. We have the conversation between Henry and Henry. Henry the writer who is desperate to write a fiction and non-fiction book about the Holocaust. And then we have Henry the taxidermist who writes a play um, that is an allegory for the Holocaust. So we have two conversations that we're following and this is also the very metacontextual element in the story because a lot of the times when Henry asks a question about the play, about what Beatrice and Virgil are talking about, I wonder often the same thing about the conversation between Henry and the taxidermist. I thought that the entire middle section where it's really about Henry visiting the taxidermist and them talking about the play or us reading the play, that was just one big lull. I didn't quite understand why it had to be Beatrice and Virgil, a monkey and a donkey, being the allegory used in the story and I'm really not sure why the author made all of these choices. There was a lot of talking that I think was supposed to be meaningful and clever but it just kind of went over my head. I was a bit bored reading the middle. If you see the these two white post-its that I put in here, they're actually there because I stumbled upon two sections that I thought were outstandingly odd. I thought that the tone of the book suddenly switched to something very weird. So there's this one section where, for example, Henry brings his wife to the taxidermy shop and they have a huge fight right after. They're yelling at each other in all caps. I thought, okay, where does that come from? Then in the second post-it, Henry gets very annoyed with the taxidermist for seemingly no reason. And the thing is, interestingly, now that I finished the book, these exact two post-its or these passages, I now understand them. But at the time, they made absolutely no sense. It's almost like they were sprinkled in there so the ending makes sense, but to me the ending was a surprise. It takes a very strange turn. Some might like that twist, I don't know if you will call it that. I'm just really not sure what the goal of that ending was. In conclusion, I'm giving this book a 3 star average, which unfortunately is below the Goodreads average, so in this case I'm going more with the masses or I'm actually slightly below them. But this did convince me more than ever to pick up Life of Pi. So unfortunately, this is a miss for me, but as it happens, my boyfriend actually then picked this up after me and he's at halfway point. He knew that I wasn't a big fan of this going in and yet he actually is enjoying it so far. He likes it, so that'll tell you how subjective reading is. <laughs> Happy Saturday. This is a different location as you can see because we're actually staying at a cottage this weekend and today is going to be a nice spa day and the cottage is super cute. I'm going to show you a little tour of it and also the view is nice. It's right by like a small body of water, a little lake. It's a perfect little cozy stay for the weekend to get a bit of reading in. And before you think, wow, her life is so glamorous, first New York and now a cottage stay, this is not normal. We're doing this because my partner actually has a week off, but we can't go anywhere big because I have to work. So instead we're doing two smaller things. So that's why. Let's talk about The Swan Book by Alexis Wright. I've never heard about this book before, but when I read the plot at that book sale, I just thought it sounds so unique. It's an Australian Aboriginal story paired with dystopia. And the author Alexis Wright is a member of the Wanyi Nation of the Southern Highlands of the Gulf of Carpentaria, Australia. Multiple things about this intrigued me. It even says on the front, one of the most important Australian novels yet. The average rating is a 3.27, just above three stars, but it's also only just over a thousand ratings and 200 written reviews. So not a lot of people have read this. This is a, seems to be a very niche book. What gives me hope is if you look at the ratings, there's mostly three stars, but very close behind is four stars. And the people who do give this a five or four star rating are really praising this as a piece of science fiction that is utterly unique with beautiful writing. I'm only 14 pages in, and it pains me to say that 
I don't think I like the writing that much. Um, immediately after reading even just the first sentence or the first page, I just got a feeling of I don't think this prose is for me. I really had to concentrate to understand what it is that I was reading. The um, paragraphs are very long, very long sentences, overly descriptive, using a lot of also words that I don't necessarily know. I don't know if it's because English is not my first language. It does feel a bit rambly. Let me just read you one sentence to demonstrate what I mean. These were anti halkion times for the lake people, where the same old festering dreams and degraded lands were struck hard and fast by a string of bad luck, which all in all amounts to the same thing happening with the surprise of being struck once or twice or a hundred more times as though it were a chosen place. I know that some people love this sort of prose. I've read books from authors like that before. What comes to mind is Sheila Heedy. That was a five stars for me. I loved it, but for some reason, this just doesn't feel right for me. Now, I'm not giving up on this. My goal would be to make it to at least page 50 or until something happens and then I will reevaluate. But it just doesn't feel like something I'm excited to pick up. I, I don't wanna, <laughs> I'm avoiding it. And because we're heading to a spa today where we're doing a water circuit, so you get a lot of downtime and relaxing time. We're just lying around and doing nothing. Usually for those times, I like to take a book. I really don't feel like taking this one book because it, I think it would hinder my relaxation a bit. So I actually packed a second book just for that. I packed My Brilliant Friend by Alana Ferrante. This is not part of the reading project because I know that this is probably going to be a four or five stars. This has been an odd reading month so far. I need a little break from the not so great books. Good evening. I just reached page 80 on the Swan book and I am very, very conflicted right now. This is an Aboriginal author. One of my priorities this year is to read more diversely and across all continents, as you know, the flavor of the prose is so, so strong. It is not something you can overlook. It is the loudest piece, the loudest voice of this story. It's beautiful, but it also feels like I need a lot of energy to get through the pages and to understand what I am reading. Now, as you can see though, from my post-its here, there were some passages that really spoke to me. Some of the passages that I marked were about the climate catastrophe that basically caused this dystopia. And the other parts that really stood out for me were the pieces about the Aboriginal Australians or Aborigines in their stories. So this is obviously weaved into also nonfiction. I'm guessing that this is what actually happened and this is not made up for this dystopian story because it's the story of how these Aboriginal detention centers were created. So the place where Oblivia and her care caretaker live is actually an Aboriginal detention center. It's technically a swamp. And there's passages in here about how these people were ripped from their homes and um, they were evaluated based on either if they could be assimilated into society or if they just need to be put away. Okay, let me see if I continue this and if not, then I will just go and look for another book written by an Aboriginal author and or even a nonfiction to learn more about Australia's story. Also, I've been saying Aborigines instead of just Aboriginal people or Aboriginal Australians, just because Aborigines is the word we used when we talked about this topic in school in Germany, but in the English language, I think maybe Aboriginal people or Aboriginal Australians is more correct. I reached page 102 in this book when I had to decide for myself, this is a DNF. I'm really sorry, but I can't get on board with the prose, with the writing in this book. It is just too much of a hurdle for me. Every time I pick this book up, I feel like I'm fighting to understand what is going on, what the author is trying to say. To me, it feels like I have to untangle all the words and sentences that are on the page to get to the story, to the characters. Maybe in other people's minds, very lyrical and poetic. And maybe if you usually are a poem reader, this is the type of prose that could really suit your reading needs. Reaching page 100, at this point we learn about the what they refer to as the old gypsy lady, Belladonna. She's the woman who found our main character, Oblivia, and raised her. We also see the beginnings of Warren Finch, the other protagonist in this book, who ends up being Oblivia's husband. So things started to happen, but again, 
it didn't help my reading experience so that's why I knew okay even with more action and learning more about the characters still not loving this book. Also I'd rather leave this completely unrated because on Goodreads I will just mark this as DNF. I will not give this any kind of rating and if we're being honest here if I end up giving this book a two star that'll actually drag down the average reviews of this book which is also doing this book a disservice especially for a book like this that has a very little amount of ratings and it is from an indigenous voice I'd rather not drag this book down in its rating but the parts that I did enjoy in this book were whenever I learned something about the indigenous people of Australia so I went ahead and searched for another book that I can put on my TBR for this year I found three books that sound really interesting and I'm just curious to know if any of you who watch this video have read one of these books because then you can vote for me to read that book in the comment section. So the first one is called Growing Up Aboriginal in Australia. It's a collection of stories. So it's by Anita Heiss, she's the editor. Um, Evelyn Ara Luen is a contributor and Baby Backhouse is also a contributor. My Tita, My Sister, Stories of Strength and Resilience from Australia's First Women by Marlee Silva and Rachel Sarah, the illustrator. Then I found Dark Emu by Bruce Pascoe. The tagline is Agriculture or Accident. Happy very, very sunny Friday. I started Why We Took the Car by Wolfgang Handoff last night. I am here for it. I am pumped. I am so hopeful that this is finally gonna be a book that I'm excited to read, that I like picking up, I want to pick it up, and I want to finish it. Oh, so fingers crossed that this is gonna be a good one. I have read how many pages? 35 pages so far, and I am liking it. So this is a YA story about teenager Mike Klingberg, who's from Berlin, and he forms an unusual friendship with Andrei Chichachov. Chick comes from a very different social background, so this is a story where two worlds collide, and he also has a stolen car, which he then takes with Mike, and I guess they drive around, and this is going to turn into an interesting coming-of-age story. This book has a rating of 3.56 stars, 30,000 ratings. That is really not bad. Now this book made it onto my TBR because of my sister who read it in school and a lot of people read this in school, which is why I think the average is still at only 3.5 because maybe a lot of people who read this in school then go on Goodreads and put their rating in and most likely they didn't enjoy it as much because they didn't read it for leisure, they read it for school, right? There's one thing that I'm dreading a little and that is political correctness in this one because this has been written in 2010. I think for a teen YA story can be a little dated. Those kind of stories I think you can really feel if it stands the test of time or if it doesn't. Now even the back of the book already describes Chick as Asozial. Now the word asozial, you will probably only understand it if you're a German speaker yourself or not just a German speaker but if you lived there because it has a very specific meaning to it. It does not translate to antisocial, that's not what that means. It usually refers to people from a lower or how do you say like weaker social background which means that they usually do not come from money. Maybe the parents have blue collar jobs or no jobs at all. A lot of times it refers to people who are from a poorer background and most of the times it refers to people from with an immigration background. Not gonna lie, this is already kind of a red flag or like thread with caution thing for me. Really trying to not go on a tangent here but Germany still has a huge structural racism problem and microaggression, huge huge issue there. And I myself very familiar with racial microaggressions whenever I'm there. So I'm trying to keep in mind that this was written in 2010. From the point of view who, of someone who probably wasn't very woke, high hopes but a bit cautious. On another note, I just logged off work for today to go to an author event this evening. I don't think I've ever been to an author event. A few weeks ago I saw an ad on Instagram about this literary festival that's happening at the moment and author Tanya Talaga is in town tonight to receive a prize. Maybe two years ago, I read her book, All Our Relations. It is the first book that I ever read about indigenous people. So Tanya herself is of Polish and Anishinaabe descent. She's a writer, a journalist, and a huge activist here in Canada. 
Happy Saturday evening and happy Canadian Independent Bookstore Day. The author event honoring Tanya Talaga yesterday was really, really cool. There was a section inside the venue where an independent bookstore actually put out a few tables where you could buy books from, which I browsed, but I didn't get anything that day. Right after they gave the author the award, there was a really cool interview portion where a local journalist actually asked a few questions and it was just really cool to hear the author speak about her experiences, about her work. Amongst other things, she was talking about how difficult it was for her as a former journalist to try to shed light on all the horrible things that happened to First Nation people in Canada. A lot of the stories to this day still remain invisible. And in the end, there was a very short Q&A section with the audience and I actually asked a question, <laughs> the closing one. I thanked her for introducing me to the literature from indigenous people. Then I asked her what other First Nation authors she loves and recommends and she was so nice and gave quite a few titles, which brings me to my next topic. I went to an independent bookstore this afternoon and got three books, so this is a mini haul portion now. So one of the books that Tanya Talaga recommended is Moon of the Crusted Snow by Wabgeshuk Rice. With winter looming, a small northern Anishinaabe community goes dark. Cut off from power and communication with no foreseeable resolution, only very few residents truly realize the community's shortfalls. I've heard the title go around before and I only heard positive things, so this had to come with me. Then I also picked up the book of Form and Emptiness by Ruth Ozeki. This is a hardcover edition and it was reduced from $34.95 to $7.99, so I had to get it. This won the Women's Prize for Fiction Award, I think last year. And lastly, I got The Hundred Years War on Palestine, A History of Settler Colonialism and Resistance, 1917 to 2017 by Rashid Khalidi. Obviously with current events and what is happening with the genocide, I it's just really high time for me to read this book and educate myself. The waiting times in my library for the physical copy or for the ebook copy on this are just horrendously long. I mean, which is great because a lot of people are now interested in this book, but I just decided to get a copy for myself. That's it for my mini haul. When you're watching this, it's not independent bookstore day anymore, but you can go any day you want. Friendly reminder to support these little stores. Hey friends, I finished Chick. It was quite a fast read. The main point of the story is the bond that forms between these two because of an incident that happens right before the summer break starts. So they spend the summer together on the road. They literally steal a car and are off on an adventure. It's a road novel like Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, but with a as a modern rendition. And especially Mike has these very typical teenage insecurities about getting attention from your fellow classmates, getting attention from girls or talking to girls. I found this book to be quite readable. The prose was easy to flow through. There were some parts where this felt like a very typical adult man writes teens and tries to speak like teens, in particular when it came to Chick, because there were some sentences in the beginning he was struggling with and vocabulary that he was he didn't know because he's a new German speaker. Then he turns around and uses big words, which I wonder how can he string those sentences together, but then some others he has issues with. So I thought there was kind of a consistency problem there. So that part in itself, you know, isolated the coming of age, going on an adventure, that would have been, I think, a 3.5 for me. It was quite enjoyable, but I just, I couldn't with the racism in this book. It is absolutely terrible. Let me start off by giving you some examples just so that you understand what I'm talking about and then we'll go into why this is especially bothering me aside from the fact that it's obviously problematic. Starting with Chick being introduced in the classroom by his teacher, the teacher does not bother to even try to pronounce his name wrong because it's too long, it's too foreign. Then this is full of Russian stereotypes. It's kids thinking, wow, this guy must be part of the Russian mafia, his new shoes must be stolen, his brother uh, deals with arms illegally. There's a passage in here where it's explicitly said that it's his own fault because he's not explaining himself. So it's all his, it's his own fault for not defying these stereotypes. On top of that, what happens very often, I think this happens to a lot of immigrants in various countries, is his intelligence gets questioned just because there's a language barrier. Then there's this typical form of microaggression where instead of referring to people by their names, they just call him the Russian at all times, the Russian. I think within the first 50 pages, they just call him the Russian 
around 10 times. Or in other parts of the book, it's the Vietnamese, the Indian, the Turk or Turk music. In case you're confused, these terms are not used to describe a person's ethnical heritage or to describe where they're from. It's a term used to alienate people. It demonstrates that they're different, that they're not German, even if maybe they are. It demonstrates this notion of us and them. And if they don't call Chick a Russian, they refer to him as the Mongol or Chink eyes. That's literally something that comes up multiple times in this book. Then throwing in some homophobe remarks in here. I was reading this thinking, okay, maybe this is gonna be addressed. Maybe there's gonna be a hint from the author that the some at least some of the characters, one of them, doesn't have to be the main characters, but somebody is gonna hint at, okay, this is wrong. But the only time where there was a direct remark about the racism problem in here was when our main character, Mike, is talking about their housekeeper who's a Vietnamese woman. I'm translating here, he's thinking, I want to treat these people normally, but they behave like employees that just remove the dirt but that's exactly what they are and I'm just 14 years old. So there's a minor, minor acknowledgement in here that maybe this is wrong, but it just ends there. There's no further thought about this. This book is still being read in classrooms today as a Bildungsroman, as a coming of age story, as a story to teach kids in school. I didn't, but I did talk to my girlfriend who did read this in school and I asked her, did the teacher or anybody ever, you know, t address the racism, the problematic parts in this book? And she straight up said, no, it wasn't. And that is what's really getting to me. I, I just fear that people pick this up in classrooms and don't really talk about the problematic parts in this. Her husband actually is a teacher. At least he told me that these days, Usually kids are more woke and they will address this and the teacher in a way is forced to, but with the caveat of it depends on the teacher, it depends where you are. One of the things that I looked up is actually course material for this book, but nowhere is the course material asking you to analyze what is wrong with this book or this view on immigrants. So you can really only hope that the teacher or you know the students in class will bring it up. To me, the author does have a responsibility, especially in a Bildungsroman. If that is how it is at the time and you want to portray that, then do so, but you need to make sure that you're saying it is wrong because this is a book for kids. I will say that most of the side characters are pretty shallow, especially the way that the girls are being handled in here very very superficial and the girls don't seem to have any other function than you know be in be a love interest for mike so my final rating for this book i think i have to subtract two stars for the issues that i had with it so it brings us from 3.5 stars to 1.5 star which makes sense because usually books that i find problematic i give a one star to that brings us to the end of this reading vlog out of the four books, two were DNFs and two I gave a lower rating than the Goodreads average. It is debatable if I can call this project a success. In a way it is because I DNF two books so I'm getting better at letting go. And the other two, who knows when I would have gotten to these books, maybe only in a few years from now. So all in all, there's four books that I am moving out of my bookshelf or from my to be read pile and I'm making room for new editions. I don't know if I mentioned this, but somewhere between The Next One to Die and Beatrice and Virgil, I watched two seasons of The Good Doctor within a few days because that is how much I was dreading to pick up the books that I had to read. Let me know in the comments if there's ever been a book that has a very low rating on some kind of platform, but you really, really enjoyed it. Thank you for sticking with me. I know this reading vlog was a bit of an odd one, why don't you leave me a swan emoji if you just want to comment and let me know that you're still watching. Thank you so much for watching and commenting as always. Please give this video a thumbs up if you enjoy watching reading vlogs and feel free to subscribe if you want to have more bookish content from me. Thank you so much for watching. I'll talk to you next time. Bye.